Shalom, and welcome to Via Hafta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. Shalom. Once again, as we open up the prophecy of Isaiah, that familiar theme once more appears. And that theme is judgment. So many people have remarked that they love the book of Isaiah. But as we have been studying this book for more than six months, people have been surprised how full of judgment these chapters are. And today in our study, there's no exception. But here we're going to encounter judgment in a general way. We've seen judgment placed upon peoples and nations. But here, God's going to speak in a general way about the results, the outcome, when he judges. And we need to remember, I've spoken about it frequently, but we need to remember that judgment is like two different sides of the same coin. One side is condemnation. It speaks of what we normally think of when we hear that concept, judgment, punishment, God's consuming condemnation and eternal suffering and punishment. That's one side of the coin. But for those who have repented, those who have said, I do not want to live in sin, but I want to obey God and have sought his grace, experienced his forgiveness by grace and mercy. Those who have entered into a covenant specifically, that covenant that Jeremiah speaks of, that covenant that the blood of Yeshua ratifies, this new covenant, a covenant of forgiveness where God does not remember our sin. For those, God's judgment should be thought about not with the word condemning, but with the word vindicating. God's judgment brings vindication for his covenant people, whereby we are positioned, and here's what's so wonderful, we are positioned in his will. Now, there is an inherent relationship between being in the will of God and being in the kingdom of God. When we are in God's will, we are going to be experiencing kingdom provision. We are going to know that kingdom joy and gladness. And ultimately, that's where the will of God leads us into the fullness of his kingdom. And that's what this chapter is going to be speaking about. Secondly, we see that this chapter, and you can take out your Bibles now and open them up to Isaiah chapter 26, and we see that this chapter is unique because we're going to find in the first verse, verse 1, the word sheer. The word sheer is best translated as a song. But in Hebrew, a song can also relate to a, a poetry. And in poetry, we see parallelism. One thing being likened to another or one thing being contrasted with another. And this is certainly, certainly the characteristic of this chapter. We're going to see a dichotomy between those who are condemned and those who are vindicated. So with that said, look with me to verse 1, Isaiah chapter 26 and verse 1. That very familiar expression, Be'yom Ha'hu, on that day. And we've learned so many times that that expression relates to Judgment Day. And usually, 
that final judgment day. And certainly within this chapter, that is the proper understanding of on that day. Verse 1, on that day, this song will be sung in the land of Judah. Now, remember the context. Isaiah is speaking. And the northern kingdom, it is far removed from the purposes of God. Throughout Isaiah's prophecy, which took place over a number of years, we see that that Assyria ultimately took the northern kingdom called Israel into captivity, and that northern kingdom was not still in existence. But we find that Judah, representing the nation of God, was. It was threatened, as we have seen, by by Assyria, but God delivered. Babylon would come and carry the Jewish people into exile, but here, We're not looking at these things from Isaiah's period. We're simply using the term Judah as referring to God's kingdom. Judah gives this passage a kingdom connection, a kingdom context. So he says, on that day, that is that final judgment day, this song will be sung in the land of Judah, meaning in regard to the kingdom of God. And then we have the word ear, which is city. And presumably, if we're speaking about Judah, what's the main city in Judah? Jerusalem. And Jerusalem has an eternal character to it. It is truly the eternal city. And therefore, the people will remark, Oz Lanu, Oz is the word for strength. Now, many translations say a strong city, but there's a problem with that. Because ear is feminine. But the word here for strength or power, oz, is masculine. So you cannot say, as as many translations do, and it's just another example of not paying attention to the grammar. You can't say, a strong city we have, but but it literally means city, referring to Jerusalem, strength we have, meaning the fact that Jerusalem exists, we are in a good position. We have hope. So he says, a city, strength to us, salvation he will place, And then it uses two words, the word for walls. And in Hebrew, we have two different words for walls. One would be kir, and this would be the walls of a house. But then we have the term chomot, which is walls that would surround a city. And what is the primary purpose of these walls? Security, defense. And then we also have another word that relates to, some translated a moat, Others translate it as those uh, uh, strong towers that provide additional security. So what God is saying here is that in the last day, the people will sing a song, a song of security, a song of defense, a song that will speak about salvation. And then he goes on, look at verse 2. Open the gates, the gates of this city. This is another reason why we should understand this city as relating to Jerusalem. Open the gates and a goy sadik. Goy, oftentimes we think of it as Gentile. But, but prophetically, frequently, when Israel, and I'm speaking about the Jewish people, are in a right spiritual relationship. That term goy is used for the Jewish people. Why? Well, we need to remember the Abrahamic covenant. God said to Abraham that that the nation that would come from him would be a goy, gadol, a great people. And therefore, prophetically, when things are good for Israel, 
we see that frequently they're called a goy. And here it's a righteous people. A goy sadiq will enter in. And it says, this people have kept imunim. Now, this would be faithfulness. It's related to the truth. It also relates to the concept of belief. They have kept the faith. They have believed, they've trusted in the things of God. And it's this concept of faith and truth, believing in that, making one's life based upon that, that causes them, by God's grace, by the work of Messiah, to be brought in to that kingdom. And this is what it's speaking about when you enter into this city, the new Jerusalem. Verse 3, Yetzer. The first word, Yetzer, speaks about, it appears in Genesis, for example, in Genesis chapter 6, where it speaks about the, the Yetzer, the inclination and we find that it has to do with a a mentality a thought we have here the expression yetzer samuch samuch is attach depending upon and what it speaks of those that have placed their thought process their indica indicate their the way they think is attached to the way that God thinks. So their inclination is attached to God's way of thinking. And because of that, it says, you will keep peace, meaning you will establish your will. That's what keeping peace is about. For peace will be, why? For in you have been trusted. We have trusted in you. They have trusted in the Lord forever. For in Yah, and I'm in verse 4, in Yah, which is a, a name of God, in Yah, Hashem, in the Lord God, we might say, is a rock, and it's this eternal rock, the rock from age to age. And this rock, Tzur, can also be in connection to Messiah. So we see faith being emphasized in several places here in the opening chapters as a basis for this change, this entering into the kingdom of God. Verse 5. Now the dichotomy, where there's one group who's going to be entering into the kingdom of God based upon faith, based upon their trust. Notice what it says concerning the others. For he has brought down the inhabitants on, on high, and the city that is exalted he has made low. He will cast it down unto the, the land, and it will arrive unto dust. So what he's speaking here is this dichotomy between those who are going to enter into the kingdom and those that are going to, they've exalted themselves. Instead of having their thought process, their inclination attached to God, they have been prideful. They have exalted themselves instead of exalting God. And therefore, when God's judgment comes, he will bring them down, and ultimately they will be brought down from their exalted position to the ground, to the earth, and they will return. They will enter into, as it says here, at the end of, of verse 5, dust. Now, they're going to be, notice the expression in verse 6, Tir mesena regal. This is being trampled by the foot. And the question is, why? And that is because they did not have a Torah mentality. And why do I say that? Well, look at this verse, verse 6. They are going to be trampled underfoot, we might say, the foot of the poor and the steps of the one who is, is meager in his possessions. 
very, very poor. So the fact that they did not turn with concern, with compassion, this is what the Torah teaches. Love your neighbor as yourself. Because they did not exemplify. They did not live out a Torah lifestyle. They were not concerned with the poor and the needy. That fact is going to bring upon them, and that's why it mentions here, the foot of the poor, the steps of the needy, those who are in a very meager circumstance. This is going to be the source of them being trampled underfoot because they ignored the ones in need. But notice the contrast. Look at verse 7. Orach. Orach is a, a pathway. It's the, the course of journey. So those who are going to be trampled, their lifestyle did not concern the one who was in need. But in contrast to that, it says, the, the pathway of the righteous is, is uprightness, is justice. And then we have the word yeshar. Now, some translators say yeshar, it means straight or upright. And it can speak to the God who is upright. Other translations simply see it as a description of what is right. That the path of the righteous, the path of the righteous, the upright, what do they do? They weigh out. They measure it. They want to bring an equality. And this word has that aspect to it. I believe the most frequent way it's translated into English is the word weigh out. But it's weighing out to bring a balance. It is a word that speaks of what is, is missing, and then you add to it. So it's a measurement that demands a response. And this is the way, the pathway of those who walk in the righteousness of God. They see what others are lacking, and they get involved. They want to help out, make up what is lacking. Verse 8. Surely the way of your judgments, O Lord, we have hope for you. Now, this is important because it says something. It teaches us how one truly has hope in God. The text says, we have hoped in you. We have hoped, or we could say, for you. Well, what's the evidence of that? Just because someone says, oh, my hope is in God, does that mean that he really has that mentality? Here it tells us. It's a word of exclamation would be a better way of saying this. A word of exclamation that says, the way of your judgments, O Lord. We have hope for those ways because it's really you we, we are desiring. You we are seeking. And then it says, your name and your memory. This is the desire, and this is the word, a strong word for, for desire, tava. Our soul has desire. So your name, your character, and when it speaks about your memory, it's having to do with your covenantal promises. We have remembered your character, and we know that your character is connected to how you behave, the promise that you make. And we want to have that same character because we want to be those that experience, experience your promises, what you have, have said in your covenantal obligations to us. That's what we desire. Verse 9. My soul desires you at night. Even my, my spirit in the midst of me. And he has a phrase here for, and it's here again, parallelism. He speaks about the night in the first half. And then he uses a word, shahar, which is dawn, the earliest part of the morning. But it's in a verb form. Now, in English, we can't do that. So we would have to translate it. 
my soul or spirit in the midst of me. I will in the early morning, and it speaks about rising up. In the early morning, I will do something. What is that? Keep reading. For just as your judgments are in the land, when God's judgment, this is what he's desiring, this is what he's praying for, this is what he's acting for, that your judgments, O oh God, would be in the land, and therefore righteousness would learn the inhabitants of the world. This is what someone who has entered into a covenantal relationship with God wants. They want righteousness in this world. And that's why, and I want to put this in the proper context, when someone says about an eternal redemption, that we have eternal life, that God will not remember our sins, you know what it gives us? It gives us assurance and security. Now, here's the problem. There are those that, that teach if you speak about eternal security, that God will never leave or forsake, that, that you can't lose your salvation, someone who teaches that, they say it's dangerous. Why? Because when someone hears, I'm eternally saved, nothing can change that. They say that will be an encouragement for that person to go out and sin. A true believer when that one hears about God's covenantal faithfulness, God's promise to not remember our sin, if that spurs one to say, let's go out and sin, this is not a true believer. A true believer wants righteousness. The whole motivation for him turning to Messiah in the first place is that he doesn't want to live in sin. And it is, in my in, in estimation, in my estimation, it is not reasonable that a true believer has tried to manipulate God saying, I'll enter into this covenant, this one that can never be changed, so that I can really do what I want, and that's sin. That's not what a true believer wants. We don't want sin. We want righteousness. Listen to what Isaiah says here in this passage. He says, my soul has desired you in the night. Even my spirit in the midst of me. I will rise up early in the morning, meaning to seek you in order to fulfill that desire. For when your judgments are in the land, righteousness the inhabitants of the world will learn that's what motivates him verse 10 now he's going to contrast that with one who is not in a covenantal relationship one who is not wanting the righteousness of god and what does it say here look at verse 10 for for favor or grace that is placed upon the wicked, a wicked one, it says, he will not learn righteousness. And in the land of uprightness, what is he going to do? If you put him in such a place, a land of uprightness, of justice, it says that he's going to want to twist that because he does not and he will not see the majesty of of the Lord he may be there but he is not going to experience God's majesty God's presence in his life so it's making a contrast between those who are truly believers those who have embraced the covenant and those who have not those who have not even when they experience God's goodness they twist that into something that it's not Verse 11, the Lord, your hand he raised, and it's speaking about, O oh Lord, you raise your hand. And then it speaks of, but they will not see. What they will see, they will look 
and they will be ashamed. Why? Because of the envy of the people. And this is a wrong desire, a jealousy. And therefore, God says, surely fire upon your enemy will consume them. Your fire upon the enemy will consume such a person. So the one that does not love God, what is his eternal destiny? Well, his destiny is right here in this verse. That is that he is going to be ashamed and he is going to be consumed by the fire of God. Verse 12. Verse 12, he goes back and speaks about what he's going to do for those who are going to be vindicated in a covenantal relationship. O Lord, you will, and it's a word for arranging or setting things in order. It's a wonderful word. O Lord, you will arrange, you will set in order peace for us. And again, that word peace is related to the will, the fulfillment of the will of God. That's what is the outcome of God's judgment for his covenant people. God will set things in order. He is going to arrange things so the fulfillment of his will is experienced by his people. He says, for us, for also all of our deeds, you have, have acted for us. Meaning this, all the good deeds, anything that we've done that has an eternal consequence, an eternal characteristic to it, it's really been God, obviously, by means of his spirit, the Holy Spirit, working in us. So it tells us theologically that those things that we do that's right, that have an eternal aspect, it's because God has, has worked through us and in us. Verse 13. The Lord our God. Now he's speaking. O Lord our God. Masters have ruled over us in addition to you. So they have been enslaved in the past, but he says, alone in you we will remember your name. So even though Israel in the past have been ruled over, that has not caused them to forget the Lord God. They have remembered him and his character in the midst of this exile. And it was that that brought them back to the land, this renewal. Verse 14. The dead, now he's going to make a distinction between dead and your dead. The dead that do not belong to God, what's going to happen to them? And the dead that do belong to God. And we'll see that, that there's two constructions of this same word here's the simple one <laughs> verse 14 dead they will not live and it uses in other words rephaim which is another word that relates to those who are dead so they will not live they will not rise up therefore you have and this means why they have not as a result of the fact that you have visited them. And this word for visit means God gets all in it. He fully commits himself. And this can be for a good purpose, to bless, to redeem, to bring about his will in someone's life, or it can be used in a negative sense, judgmental or punishment. And that's how it's being used here as a result that you have, have visited them and you have destroyed them. And all memory, all of their memory, you have caused to perish. So they will be remembered no more. Verse 15. But what has God done for his people? And we're going to see this inherent relationship between his people and the land. Anyone who studies the scripture needs to realize this emphasis throughout the Bible upon the land. 
And he says here, verse 15, you have added to the people of the Lord. And again, this word for people or nation, it's the word goy. Another example of how God speaks about Israel and those who come into Israel, those who are grafted in as a goy, relating to, once more, we talked about it, we'll mention again, those who have a connection to Abrahamic covenant. And the Abrahamic covenant, the foundation of it, is the seed of Abraham. And Paul says in Galatians 3.16, that seed is Messiah. So you have expanded. You have added to the, the nation of the Lord. You have added to this people. And it says, you have done glorious and, and far all the ends of the earth, which means, he says twice, you've expanded. But in the end, he speaks about the borders, the ends of the land. He has expanded. And one of the things that, that several commentators say is this. He's expanding the land because a great number of redeemed will be brought into it. So it speaks about God's judgment in consuming the enemy, as we saw in the previous chapter, but there will also be an expansion for this, this nation that belongs to him. Verse 16. O Lord, and this is an example of what's going to bring Israel to repentance. It's going to be Etzerah Yaakov a time of trouble. Jeremiah speaks about Jacob's trouble, Jacob's trial. And it says here, and this is just pointing out that God can use difficulties to bring someone to salvation. Verse 16, O Lord, in trouble, they have visited you. Now, it's the same word, which means to respond, to be all in. It's a word of commitment. And biblically, prophetically, when it's related to God, it speaks about God's commitment to either destroy or save. That one will either be extremely blessed by God or extremely cursed, but he's going to do it to the full. And now it says, O Lord, in trouble, they have visited you. They have poured out and the word here is lachash, which is oftentimes whisper, but in this context, it means a prayer. And, and your, your uprightness is to them. Now, this is a word, musar, it can be ethics. It means that there's been a change from, from walking in disobedience to embracing the ethical standards of God. Verse 17. Like a, a pregnant woman draws near to birth, she suffers and she cries out in her labor pains. Now, this is again speaking about, about Israel. In this time of trouble, the worst time of trouble that will be upon Israel in the last days, she is likened to a pregnant woman who draws near to give birth. She, she cries out in suffering her labor pains. Thus, we are before you, O Lord. Verse 18. We, we have become pregnant. We have suffered like one that gives birth. But what has been born? Wind. And salvation has not been done in the earth. Now, what it's speaking here is about how Israel had nothing to do with their, their salvation in bringing about the kingdom. They were called to, but they failed. They failed miserably. This is what verse 18 is speaking about. They were not ones who established salvation. They were not ones who have done this in the land. And it says here, 
but have not fallen the inhabitants of the world, meaning Israel has not brought a change. They have not defeated the enemies, then them and then themselves. They have not defeated the enemies, the tyrants, the, the wicked leaders of the world. In other words, what this verse is saying, and it's a, a great verse theologically, is that Israel has no merit, nothing that they can turn to and say, God, you've saved us, you've redeemed us, you brought us into the kingdom because of what we have done. No, the only reason that Israel has turned to God is because of this time of trouble. Verse 19. But in contrast, go back, if you would, to, to verse 14, where it says, Dead, they will not live. And these Rephaim, this other word for dead ones, they will not rise up. God's punished them. They are destroyed by the judgment of God. But look, if you would, to verse 19. It's different. You're dead, speaking to Israel, the covenant people. Your dead will live. And my dead body will rise up. And the word is together. Your dead and my dead body will rise up. It will come to an end, meaning the sleep will be over. And we will shout, and this is a word of joy, the ones who dwelt in dust. It all foreshadows, it's the term for those who are going to be resurrected. For dew is the light of your dew. Now, the word tau, meaning like the morning dew, has a, a special significance in Judaism. In fact, every day in the summertime from Passover until the fall and the Feast of Tabernacles, the end of that, we pray for dew to come down. It's seen as a blessing because water is seen as a blessing. Water is seen as related to life. And what it says here in this passage of Scripture, for, for the dew, this is what gives life. It's not the physical water, but the light of your dew, what you provide for your people. And the land of, of these uh, uh, dead ones, it says, they have fallen. So we see the contrast once more to what, what God is saying. Verse 20. Go, my people, and, and come into your, your chambers and close your door behind you. Hide for a little while until wrath passes. Now, this verse teaches emphatically that, that unredeemed Israel will go through the wrath of God. God is going to, and this is what this verse speaks of, shelter them, protect them. This is not the case for believers. We will be removed prior to the wrath of God. But it's going to be during the time of Jacob's trouble that the wrath of God will be falling. But again, Jacob's trouble, the source of it, is not God's wrath, but the persecution of the enemies of God, led by the Antichrist. So God says here, Go, my people, enter into your chambers, close the doors after you, hide for a little while until shall pass wrath. Verse 21, our last verse. For behold, the Lord will go forth. This is him at the end of that period of time. For behold, very important word, grabs our attention. For behold, the Lord goes forth from his place. Lifkod, another word, the same word we've talked about, visiting, doing something to the full extent. God's going to respond. He is going to visit the iniquity 
upon those that dwell upon the earth. It will be visited upon him, that dweller of the earth. Now, we know in the book of Revelation, it makes a dichotomy between two people. Those who dwell in the heavens and those who dwell in the earth. And again, I say this a lot. It has nothing to do with where they are physically located. It has to do with their commitment. Whether they have a, a citizenship in the kingdom of God or whether they belong to the world. And what God says here in this passage, for those that belong to the world, he says... At that time, he is going to go forth and visit, judge their iniquity upon them and shall be revealed of the land, their blood. And blood, it means its blood, referring to the land, those of the land. This is speaking about guilt. When blood is, is re revealed, it's speaking about their gift, g guiltiness. And will not be covered any longer. It's dead. The ones that they have killed. Instead of being instruments of life. Their lifestyle. Their behavior. Their mindsets. All minister death. Rather than ministering life. So again. Those who are in a covenantal relationship. Those who love God. They are going to want to be a blessing. They will never take God's grace and want to exploit that for sinful purposes. No, the true experience of God's grace leads us to be committed in mind and deed. Remember that rising up in the morning in order to carry out the purposes of God. So a wonderful chapter concerning a proper understanding of God's judgment, this, this dual aspect. Remember the two sides of the same coin. Judgment, one side, condemnation, the other side, vindication. Shalom from Israel. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel.